Good morning, everybody. My name is David Steiner. I'm the director of the CUNY Institute for Education Policy and the dean of the School of Education at Hunter College. Welcome uh, and thank you for battling the rain. Uh, we will be joined very shortly by President Rabb of Hunter College, who has been battling traffic for the last hour and a quarter um, and is close by. It is a great pleasure to see you all here for what is such a critical issue for all of us in this room. I need hardly say to you that the data on college entrance and college completion is sobering. As we look at it across the world, where once the United States was first in the world in this area, we almost every year now slip down the table. Um, and this isn't about data, it's about human beings. It's about human beings who often struggle desperately to get into college and then find themselves unable to stay leaving only with debt and no degree. Or it is a situation where the schools they're in simply fail to prepare them for any realistic option of getting into college. Um, this breaks down, as I don't need to tell you, on economic and racial grounds um, in a way that frankly is creating really two Americas. The speakers we have today are real practitioners. This isn't about window dressing or decoration. This is about real discussion, about real problems. And that's what the Institute stands for, realistic debate and discussion and analysis about the pragmatics of getting better. We have with us today our new chancellor, Chancellor James Milliken, who joined us on June 1st. I don't know what it feels like to take over the nation's largest urban public university, <laughs> um, but I do know that when I became commissioner of education and realized I was responsible for two million um, young people who were approaching college age and another million who were going into kindergarten and a million in university, I tried not to think about it. Um, I, James Milliken joins us, of course, having led the University of Nebraska system, having been a very senior administrator um, in the South, at North Carolina, uh, an expert on international competitiveness, technology, online learning. Um, these are skills that will stand him in terrific stead here at CUNY. Um, this is a leadership role that is not just about this city, but it's about the nation. Can a major urban public university flourish in this century, given our economic structures, the lack of support from the state, the tradition um, of opening our arms to all those who make it from high school, but who we know are desperately short of making it, even in our first year community colleges. And let me close with one data as I introduce the chancellor. In the last couple of years, as we accept freshmen into the community colleges of CUNY, who, all of whom come with their high school diploma, between 75 and 85% of them are not ready to take a community college course without remediation. That is the gap between what we've produced in our K-12 system and what our universities are ready for. Instead of yelling at each other across that gap, we have to hand out our, our worth our, our hearts, our energies, our intelligences to overcome that gap. And that will be one of the most important tasks of our new Chancellor, Chancellor Milliken. Thank you, David. If I had waited, if you'd gone on a few minutes longer, you could have said everything I was going <laughs> to say in my uh, remarks this morning. Um, you did draw it into sharp focus. Uh, I wish you would not have reminded me what a big job I've uh, taken, especially after giving me your advice uh, from when you were commissioner. So it looks like we have a great crowd. I've reviewed the list of people who are here uh, today. There's nothing more important, as the dean said, than the task we have before us. I have a particular interest in this as the chancellor of CUNY, the institution that for 150 years has offered a pathway to success and to the middle class for so many generations of immigrants, first generation students, low income students. But to continue to do that and to do it in a meaningful way for the next generation, we have to do a much better job of making sure that students are prepared for college and then once they get there uh, that they succeed. Now we've seen dramatic increases over the last decade uh, in graduations from, from CUNY, which is great news. 
I mean, it's always great that we have more CUNY degree holders going out into the marketplace and uh, fulfilling their aspirations and dreams. So about 10 years, a little over 10 years ago, we had 31,000 uh, degrees across all our campuses awarded. Uh, 10 years later, 47,000 degrees. Now we're over 48,000 degrees. But uh, before we declare victory, I have to understand that much of that increase is based on an increase in graduates from New York City schools and growth in enrollment at CUNY. We have considerable work to do remaining on making sure that those who do enter are successful, persisting, uh, and graduating. Public higher education, of which CUNY occupies a very unique space, in my view is all about broad access, high quality programs, and success of our students, and preparing them uh, for a world of work or continuing education. CUNY does this about as well as any place, I think, this very sometimes difficult balance of providing broad, affordable access, but also high quality. Uh, if we do only one of those, uh, we're not serving uh, our community and we're not serving uh, our students. We have to accelerate the focus now on success for those students uh, that we enroll. So a number of years ago, uh, CUNY uh, initiated a policy change which focuses our remedial work, as you know, at community college. It's been an important part of our transformation. Now over half of the undergraduates at our most selective colleges, such as Baruch, Hunter, Brooklyn, City, start as community college systems uh, students at CUNY, meeting remediation requirements and then transferring to a senior college. So in my view, this work over the last 10 to 15 years has been all about developing a set of strategies that give students a meaningful opportunity uh, to succeed. And I see President Rabb has succeeded in getting through traffic. <laughs> Welcome to Hunter College. Very happy. I think that's what she was gonna say ahead of me, so the tables are turned. But nationally, the three-year graduation rate at urban community colleges is about 16%. At CUNY, it's less than that. And I understand that our figures don't take into account all of the transfers uh, prior to when they would have graduated. That's another problem that we have to fix both at community colleges and senior colleges, how we count to accurately reflect the success of our students. But I suspect that under any way we counted, the results uh, are not good enough. Certainly the national results are not good enough and we are not satisfied to be anywhere near uh, those national averages. We cannot be satisfied when a majority of our students who enroll with the intention of graduating uh, do not do so within three years. We're losing too many students and failing to deliver the credential that they came to us to get. We need to do better. And we've had great strides with a number of innovative programs. Uh, ASAP, the Accelerated Studies and Associate Programs, the latest figures for the three-year graduation rates for students in the ASAP program is over 50%. Our new community college, Gutman Community College, a new model demonstrates rethinking some of the principles uh, in community colleges uh, today. Just graduated its inaugural class uh, in August. I attended the graduation. 28% of those students graduated in two years uh, at Gutman, far higher than the national three-year rate. So we can do this. We can uh, be creative. We can think about ways that uh, we can support students and help them graduate at a much uh, uh, sooner level uh, and be much more successful. So we made great strides with Gutman, with ASAP. These programs are limited to a relatively small number of full-time students. One of the things that I think we need to be thinking about now is the next step. How do we scale those programs to address not only the full-time students who would benefit, but students who necessarily enroll part-time so that they, who probably need the support even more, get the support they need to continue to persist, albeit at a, on a longer schedule, but still get their uh, degree. So 
that's something we need to do. We also need to examine our mediation programs. I mean, um, all too often these are end up being barriers uh, to students continuing their education. We need to apply, I think, the same innovative thinking and creativity to these programs so that we are giving students that the dean mentioned 75 to 80 percent who present with remediation needs, giving them a realistic opportunity uh, to be successful when they uh, get to CUNY. Our partnership with the New York City Schools could not be more important. It is a fundamental uh, partnership and a building block for student success uh, at CUNY. And as the dean said, far too many of the students are unprepared. It's not about assigning blame. We need to work together. We are sort of joined at the hip uh, in this endeavor. We need to use New York's robust P20 data system. We need to partner in curriculum development and early college and pre-college programs. We need to work together, the people in this room, public schools in New York and CUNY, to, ass to assure that our students arrive ready to go to college, that they get a high quality education uh, at our community colleges and our senior colleges, and they graduate in a timely way. This is the way that we will continue the legacy of CUNY uh, over the last 150 years of being what Andy Grove referred to as the great American dream machine, the way that New Yorkers uh, can become part uh, of a growing middle class uh, and fulfill their aspirations and those of their families. So I thank all of you for your dedication to this work, which could not be more important for, for us at CUNY, but for New York, uh, and as the dean mentioned, for the country. Thanks very much for your work today. Good morning. Um, <clears throat> I'm Jennifer Rabb. I have a great privilege of being the president of Hunter College, of uh, working for somebody as inspirational as our chancellor, J.B. Milliken, who understands what we all understand this conference, that this takes true leadership to address this problem. Um, I was just so uh, grateful when Dean Steiner asked us to host this conference today because there really could be no more appropriate place for all of you to be today to think about this, pretty, this incredibly critical issue than the home of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, Eleanor and Franklin were the leaders in the, uh, in the world of the 20th century in committing to social justice, and they understood in a very early time that education truly was a civil right. Um, Eleanor said quite succinctly, on the public school largely depends the success or failure of our great experiment in government by the people for the people. And that there could be obviously no true democracy without an educated public. One other really truly inspirational thing that I wanted you all to think about today as you work through this problem was that this is also one of the places where Sarah Roosevelt invited Mary McLeod Bethune, one of the, really the first African-American women to be a college president and somebody committed to the education of African-Americans um, in a very early time. And Roosevelt, the Roosevelts embraced Mary McLeod Bethune and supported the growth of education in the African-American community. And today we are still not where we need to be but in this house, some of the great advancements occurred, and I hope that spirit infuses the work that you do today. Um, from my perspective, I can say to all of you, thank you for the work that you're doing in this area, but to also ask you to keep prodding us, all of us in leadership positions on this issue. Um, it's a, perhaps a trite expression, but it takes a village is really true in the area of college retention. At Hunter College, we treat this like a war room. We have charts and graphs, and we ask each one of us in each area, what can we do to move the needle? And for the administration, it's financial aid, it's creating the, enough classes for the faculty, it's early intervention so students don't get out, you know, fail out of classes, and it's advising, and each one of us has our responsibilities, and it's a true call to action. And Asking our community to embrace this is the most important thing we've done with the support of Dean Steiner. We are very proud that over the last 13 years we have moved our graduation rate by 14 percentage points. But it's simply not enough. I feel it's tragic when I address our class, our incoming class at convocation, and I have to face the fact that hundreds of bright young faces that I'm looking at will not be back the next year, the next year will not graduate. 
it's still a tragedy. So we have good news, and we know some of the strategies that work, but it's not enough. So I see today as another call to action to ask all of us, whichever role that we're playing within higher education and K through 12, to make this the thing that drives us when we get up in the morning because we are losing too many brilliant minds from the pipeline. I thank you for being here today, for embracing this part, this incredibly important problem. And I just really want to give a special shout out to David Steiner. Uh, this is somebody who, in every level of education, from his work as state commissioner to his work at our education school, where every day he gets up and says, how do we improve the training of teachers so that they can do a better job of reaching students at all levels? and keeping them in the system. So David, congratulations on this conference, on, on this work that you're doing. And um, let's give you a round of applause. So. <laughs> and, I bring up my, and, and from the CUNY side, not only th uh, to thank the Chancellor for the work that he's embraced in, our, in uh, this very large university with all levels in which each place deserves a certain level of attention from the community college to the doctoral level, um, I'm very happy to bring up a dear friend, John Magalescu, who is, uh, has embraced this mission and been a great supporter and one of the people in CUNY for decades who has said that CUNY is only as good as the Department of Education because these are our students. And John, I think that CUNY would not have the partnerships we have with DOE if you had not really had that vision all along. So thank you for being here and for all you've done. Thanks, Jennifer. Very kind remarks, and Jennifer's a friend and a passionate leader and endless energy. Uh, good morning. I'm John Mogulescu. I'm the Senior University Dean for Academic Affairs. I'm also the Dean of the CUNY School of Professional Studies. Um, I, the Chancellor began by saying if David went on any longer, he would be stealing some of his r remarks, and I would say the same to the Chancellor, because I'm going to repeat some of the things in perhaps a different, little bit different uh, uh, way. Uh, let me start by thanking both uh, President Rabb and, and our, our Chancellor for opening the day. Uh, you can't address issues of college completion in a system as big as ours without the strong support of university leaders. Uh, and the presence of the two of them here today, I think, is uh, kind of indicative of the importance that, that they hold with regard to these, these issues. Um, the Chancellor's remarks reflect what I've come to know about him in the short time he's been at CUNY. Uh, he's committed to identifying supporting CUNY's efforts that challenge the status quo. He invites and welcomes new ideas. Uh, he's a great listener. He's a really good questioner as, uh, as well. And his top priorities include increasing college completion rates and addressing <coughs> troubling inequities in student achievement. Um, David, who I've known and we've been friends for some time, and we push each other a whole lot, came up with the idea for this conference and asked the Office of Academic Affairs in my unit to co-sponsor co this, and we were delighted to do that. Uh, David's a wonderful educator. I want to give a shout out to Ashley Burner for helping plan the conference, uh, and then a number of members of my staff, Cass Conrad, Eric Hoffman, and Tracy Mead, who are truly exceptional educators, who uh, have been behind many of the ideas for a lot of the successful programs here at the university. Um, I've been at CUNY for almost all of my adult life, started in 1972. I've been fortunate to work on projects that have truly changed the university and our way, way of thinking about student success. I've had the opportunity to work with truly a, an extraordinary group of educators. And our team, and I'm going to brag a little bit here, has created and implemented such programs as ASAP, CUNY START, the CUNY Service Corps, the CUNY Language Immersion Program, an array of programs managed in cooperation with the New York City Public Schools, such as our early college high schools, College Now, and Graduate NYC. We have built two new CUNY institutions, Gutman Community College and the CUNY School of Professional Studies. I'm proud to say that staff from all of these programs, or in a number of these programs, are featured today in today's program. You'll hear directly from them. They're wonderfully creative and passionate educators. Um, during the past 15 years, we've learned a lot, and I'd like to mention just a few of the important lessons that have driven uh, my work and, and our work. Uh, to seriously address the college completion gap, 
I think we need to begin by honestly discussing the present state of affairs. That conversation needs to be public, inclusive, and driven by data. To start, all administrators, faculty, and staff need to know the graduation rates for their colleges. You'd think they, everybody does. I don't think they do. Uh, and they need to know them by race and ethnicity and gender. And we also need to ensure that our campuses and schools are safe environments for the critical and difficult conversations about educational equity and completion. These are not simple conversations. They're hard ones. We must acknowledge that the present outcomes do not represent the best we can do. An important question for us to answer as we think about our work is, what do you do with academic programs that have not been successful? A good example of this, and the Chancellor referred to it, and David referred to it, is traditional remedial education. For far too many students, the present structures and instruction have just not worked. However, we have begun to demonstrate at CUNY that through programs such as CUNY START, remediation can be done differently with dramatically better results, and we are hopeful that this model can go to scale, one of the things, again, that the Chancellor mentioned. Offering programs year after year that are not successful simply make no sense. They're going to have the same results. ASAP is the best example of a program where a major difference in thinking has brought about results beyond those that had ever been considered possible. Historically, most of the attention at public systems like CUNY has been directed towards our community colleges and the large number of underprepared students there who don't succeed. Given how many students there are at community colleges and low graduation rates, the emphasis is appropriate. We need to focus on that. However, it's time that equal emphasis be placed on our four-year schools, as President Rabb indicated in her remarks. While graduation rates have increased some at these schools, Far too many students still don't graduate or take too long to do so. Um, the idea of accepting that the standard for measuring graduation at our four-year colleges is six years needs to change. I also worry that CUNY's success in attracting better prepared students to our most selective colleges have the possibility of widening the achievement gap if we are not more focused on helping underrepresented students get in and stay in. It's crucial that our universities and colleges work closely with local public school systems. Both David and, and the chancellor mentioned this on issues rated, related to college readiness. More students enter college with the ability to immediately do college level work is crucial to college success. I think here in New York City, we've made a good start in connecting the two systems. Our data sharing agreement is exceptional and has provided both systems with information we never had before. We continue to work together to solve issues related to math preparation and are attempting to figure out how to prepare black and Hispanic students for STEM-related disciplines. We can't go backwards on this work. We have to build on what we've done with, with uh, uh, our two systems and with new leadership at both. We need to, to, to move forward. My final point is about affecting, <coughs> affecting real change. Um, the most approach, the most successful programs and have, uh, that I have been part of uh, have been driven by bold ideas and lofty goals. If you look at ASAP, CUNY Start, Gutman, Language Immersion Program, Early College High School, each of those programs has created new models and not worked around the margins to make temporary and incremental change. I believe their success is a direct result of that. Today's going to be a great day. Lots of smart people getting together to discuss what I always say is the most important issue in any conversation involving the future of higher education, improving our completion rates, and doing so for all student populations. We're beginning to have some of the answers. We still need new thinking and new programs that continue to challenge the status quo and the courage to scale up what works. Uh, the people in this room are an amazing group of people. I have no doubt that we're going to have a great discussion here today. I thank you for coming, and, and I wish you a very good day. Thanks very much. Thank you all. I see an absolutely packed room, which is always a delight. And I know many of the faces. We have K-12 here. We have higher ed. We have folks who are in think tanks and policy institutes. Um, so this is the right group to think about this. Let's get straight to work, and I invite the first panel to come up. 
Hi, good morning, everyone. <laughs> good morning, everyone. <laughs> Um, my name is Janelle Clay. I'm with the Office of uh, Research, Evaluation, and Program Support in the CUNY Office of Academic Affairs. I'm going to be moderating this first exciting panel um, this morning, um, focusing on academic rigor and instructional support. Um, our panelists this morning, in order of how they'll present, Josipa Waxa, Associate Professor of Sociology and Education, and the Associate Director at the Center for Advanced Study of Teaching and Learning in Higher Education, at the University of Virginia. Vanessa Coca, Research Fellow at the Research Alliance for New York City Schools, and Gail Cooper Spurt, Director of College Transi Transition Curriculum and Instruction at the CUNY, of CUNY Office of Academic Affairs. Um, at the end of our presentation, we'll have time for um, questions and, and answers, um, so we'll ask that you hold your questions until then. Um, so I'll go ahead and turn it over to Josepha. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you for uh, coming and thank you for inviting me to uh, speak this morning. Um, I'm going to start with uh, perhaps even a more troubling question, which is what happens even when students graduate? What kind of skills they leave higher education with? So even when we get to that success point, even when we get them across the finish line, what does it actually look like? Um, I will try to summarize two books in 15 minutes and <laughs> see how well I can do that. Uh, but I'm going to draw on the work that uh, I've been doing for the last uh, few years with Richard Aram um, on academically adrift and, uh, and aspiring adults adrift. Uh, we have, s since basically 2006, been uh, tracking students uh, through college with the help of Lumina Teagle, Carnegie uh, Foundations, as well as uh, CAE, who has helped us with data collection. So we are um, grateful. Lumina, Fort Teagle, and Carnegie, sorry. So um, I'm going to get started right in the data and the results, given that I have 15 minutes to try to convey some important information. To just give you a sense of what are we looking at, so in, in kind of uh, idea of what our data can say, um, we are tracking students from the fall of 2005, which was the fall of their freshman year, as they progress through college. These are all four-year college students who are what would be called traditional college students, so kind of your 18-year-olds full-time enrolled. They're progressing through. We are talking to them again in, a fall of, in the spring of 2007, which is the sophomore year, and then spring of 2009, which is their senior year. Um, we have followed them then after college to, to one year out and two years out to see how they're doing after they've actually completed their four years of study. Um, academically Adrift covers the first two years of college um, and looks at about 2,300 students as they make those two crucial years. And then Aspiring Adults to Drift looks at the whole four years of college and then what happens to students afterwards. And we're talking about 1,600 students uh, in their senior year and about 1,000 students afterwards. We also do have some interviews, but I'm not going to use those when we, uh, when we talk today. Um, so in addition to surveys, so we've surveyed students, asked them a lot about their experiences, their courses, their extracurriculars, what they do in college and how things are going, but we also had something called the CLA. And given that you're in New York, many of you may know about the CLA, the Collegiate Learning Assessment. It is an instrument that aims to measure critical thinking, complex reasoning, and writing. Um, those are the skills that most of us say are the goals of higher education, that we want to develop those skills that students who graduate, particularly with four-year degrees, should be able to think critically, analyze, engage the world, and write competently. Um, this is a direct measure of students' um, performance in these dimensions. And why I emphasize that is that in, even though in higher, in higher education we've had lots of conversations about student learning, they've mostly been based on student self-report. So in a senior year of college, we ask students right before they exit, you know, how much do you think you have learned in critical thinking, writing, problem solving? And they all say they learned a lot. We all think we're better than average, right? We all think that we do a great job. And so this was the question was, you know, how well can we validate that with some kind of an instrument that's actually an objective measure? And we've been doing that in K, K through 12 for a very long time, right? Trying to actually understand how well students perform uh, on different metrics. Um, it is not a multiple choice instrument, which was important uh, to us, and it, it tries to essentially be a holistic way of measuring these complex skills. It tries to place students in an environment in which they might find themselves after college, give them a scenario, give them documents, information, and they have to read, analyze, synthesize, and write about. Um, I'm happy to talk a lot more about instrument in Q&A, but wanted to at least give you a flavor of what, what this is like. So what does this look like? Okay, so the students take the test, right, at the fall of their freshman freshman year, the end of their sophomore year, end of their senior year. How much do they improve? 
The first two years of college, the students improve 0.18 standard deviations. For those of you who don't care about standard deviations, that is a seven percentile point gain. Okay, what that means is that if students came in at a 50th percentile, right, right in the middle of the distribution, two years later, after two years of college instruction, they will be only at a 57th percentile of the incoming freshman class. Okay, they've only moved seven percentile points. Um, and one can say, well, the first two years are kind of rough. Right, um, these big classes, lectures, students are not in their majors yet, they're not really engaged, so maybe things get better. Unfortunately, they don't. Okay. When we look at the four years of college, the gain is only about half a standard deviation, which is 18 percentile points. If you divide it out based on how many semesters are in between these time points, you'd actually get the exactly the same gain for every single semester. Um, and so, you know, it, students don't necessarily pick up and really start developing these skills as they enter their, their junior or senior year. Um, one question here is also, well, you know, this instrument, how good is it? It's new, it's just being developed, how can, how can we think about it? Um, so I put up there a study done by Ernie Proscarola at Iowa and his colleagues that, that replicated the findings uh, of uh, of our study, and the, they find, which is a different sample, different instrument, different group of schools, different group of students, uh, they find that a gain between a senior and a freshman and senior year is about 17 percent odd points, right? So um, it seems at least that, you know, we are consistent in the sense that this is about how much students gain over their four years of college. We have called this limited learning, and I'm happy to talk about that more in terms of, you know, whether it is and, and why do we call it limiting learning. And it's not just limited, it's highly unequal, okay? So these are just descriptive statistics for uh, students from different family backgrounds, so whose parents have high school or less, some college, college degree or graduate professional degrees. And if you look at, you know, in the first year, students who are from less educated families, of course, enter college with lower performance in the CLA scores. Um, part of the good news, I guess, is that everybody gains over time. So if you look at the gray bars, right, they go up for each group of students, so everybody gains, and the gain is about the same across. Now, on the one hand, that's good news, which means everybody's improving in terms of all students from all family backgrounds. The other side of it is that inequality persists, right? Essentially what this says is with whatever inequality students enter college, that's the same that they leave. Right, so essentially what we're doing is just kind of moving them up to the next level, but not actually addressing the inequalities with which they enter. Um, by race and ethnicity, the news is much worse. So if we look at, uh, you know, CLA scores, again, at the freshman year and the senior year, African American students enter college, right, su substantially behind their white peers. So other groups do so as well, but the gap between African American and white students is substantial. And it's not even that. The gap grows over time. So if you look at the differences between the black and the gray bars, right, there's the least amount of improvement for the African American students and there's most improvement for the white students, right? So it's not only that African American students enter behind our colleges and universities in terms of their performance on critical thinking, complex reasoning, and writing, it is that they actually even fall further behind. They're graduating college even when they make it through, and we know that completion rates are not great and they vary by class and race. Even when they actually finish and get to that finish line, they're leaving college with substantially lower levels of critical thinking, complex reasoning, and writing skills than their white peers. Um, why that's the case, right? Uh, we try to kind of uh, explore a little bit what might be driving those gaps. Um, and so these are just model-based results, kind of trying to think about different factors that contribute to those gaps. These are the two important differences, right? About a third of that gap is due to academic preparation, right? So African-American students enter college, as has been mentioned this morning, uh, you know, uh, with lower levels of academic preparation, and we're talking about SAT scores and high school GPA, um, and that has a lot to do with how uh, they progress through college and, and their gaps in CLA performance. Um, and then there's also uh, some contribution here to, to the institutions themselves, and I think conversation this morning was about, you know, we have to look at K through 12, and we have to look at ourselves in higher education, and I think this, this figure suggests that a big part of the gap has to do with what they bring in from K through 12, but it's also a good portion of the gap even net of academic preparation that has to do with institutions they attend, right? African American students tend to attend institutions that show lower gains in CLA over time. And so it's something we have to think about and be concerned about, both in terms of how they come and what we do afterwards. 
Uh, I'm trying to do a little good news after I've done all the bad news. Uh, so the good news is that, that there are certain things we can do in higher education that actually move the needle in a sense of improving critical thinking, complex reasoning, and writing. Um, one thing we can do is we can uh, expect a lot of students. When students say that our faculty have high expectations, they improve the critical thinking, complex reasoning, and writing much more than when students say the faculty don't. Um, similarly, when students are asked to read and write in their classes, they improve their critical thinking, complex and writing. Well, that's not surprising, right? If you have to read, if you have to write, if you have to actually engage in complex tasks, you're going to improve the skills that, that are in. Now, the, sorry, I'm going to slip back to the bad side. The bad side is that very few students do these things, okay? So, when we're talking about reading and writing requirements here um, that are ba quite basic. So, we ask students uh, in terms of how many courses they took in which they had to write uh, 20 pages over the course of a semester. Right? So, so we're not talking about you know, big 20 page paper, just 20 pages all semester long. These are four year students full time. Um, and basically, a half of them say, I don't take classes like that. Right? Um, and then we ask how many of them are assigned to read 40 pages a week. Um, and they're just, you're being asked to do it. We're not even talking about doing it with depth, with care, with uh, you know, just, just you know, you know, syllabus. It says you have to do it. Um, and a third of the students say, I don't take classes like that, right? Um, so, you know, even though when students read and when students write, and, and there's other evidence that when they engage in more complex tasks, right, deep learning um, and application and, and innovation, they actually do better. But the problem is that many of them do not engage in those kinds of tasks. So, in one hand, we know certain things that matter and certain things that make a difference. On the other hand, those things are hard to find in higher education. Uh, similarly, when we look at students' time use, this is just kind of what do they do with their time? They're not reading and writing a whole lot, right? Uh, so they're also not studying a whole lot. Average four-year full-time college student today spent 12 hours a week studying. Okay, 12 hours a week studying. Um, and actually, they spend nine hours a week studying alone. Right? Although we're never alone these days, right? There's always a gadget with us. But, uh, you know, and then they spend about three hours a week studying with peers. Uh, these are the gains on the CLA scores, and you can see that when students spend more time studying alone, the CLA scores go up. When they spend time studying with peers, uh, those scores go down at about the same rate they go down when they spend time in fraternities and sororities. Now, this finding has gotten quite uh, a lot of attention, and I'm happy to talk about it more in Q&A, but I think it's an important issue to think about in terms of how students spend their time, and are they investing in activities that help to facilitate their critical thinking, complex reasoning, and writing. Um, the other question is, um, the other thing that matters, right, is college major. Okay? Um, so, students who major in social sciences, humanities, uh, science, and math, so what we usually think about is kind of the arts and science core, those students perform substantially better on the CLA over time than the students in other fields. The lowest gains in the CLA scores over time um, are in business and education and social work. Um, and now, again, what's troubling here is that business has become uh, the number one major in our colleges and, and is now the, the biggest major in four institutions. And so, you know, this, it's, it's, we know where students improve these skills, we know where learning is happening, but we seem to be doing everything we can in higher education to move away from those places and move into places where less learning occurs. Um, now, why does it matter? I mean, first of all, I guess it matters because we should care. We should care whether our students are leaving college with critical thinking, computational, and writing skills. And the other reason we should care is because it matters for the labor market. Okay? So this is just one snapshot from the second book, which is that when students leave college with low CLA scores, okay, they are much more likely to be unemployed. They're also much more likely to be in unskilled occupations. And there's a whole lot of other things we look at in a book, right? So it actually, it's not just about our commitment and what we care about and what matters to us. It's also how we are preparing these students for the transition afterwards. Um, so that is just kind of a summary for you. What we're talking about is we have limited learning in higher education. We have persisting or growing gaps in learning across students from different backgrounds. Academic rigor is associated with improved learning, but academic rigor seems to be low, right? Um, and then employment outcomes matter with what happens in college, and therefore we should care both because it matters to us as educators, but also because it matters what happens to students after they leave. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so what I'm going to talk to 
you about today is academic rigor in high school. Yosef talked a little bit about academic rigor in college, and I'm going to take us back to high school. Um, and I'm going to do this using two lines of research that I've been involved in. One is uh, uh, some, some research in Chicago Public Schools by the Consortium on Chicago School Research, who has dug deep into some of these questions about looking at students' transitions from high school to college. So I'm going to share some of that with you. But I'm also going to share some emerging research at the Research Alliance for New York City Schools and looking, looking deeply at students' transitions into high school. But before I go into the research findings, um, I want to acknowledge that there are a myriad of factors that come into play when we think about students' uh, com completion in college and the college completion gap. And I want to make one slight distinction. So when I think about the gap, I'm thinking about the gap between students' own aspirations for themselves, their, their educational aspirations, which are actually quite high and have grown quite a bit over time, um, and, and their degree attainment. So, that's, that's the gap that I'm interested in closing. And so, as I mentioned, there are a number of factors. Uh, academic is a big one that I'll be focusing on today, but there's also social and financial factors that play into uh, students' completion rates heavily. And fortunately, we have a number of panelists who will talk about that today, but I will focus on the academic piece. Um, I think everyone in this room can probably agree that, it, that academic rigor in high school is important for students' college outcomes. Um, and we could probably agree that uh, there is constrained access to academically rigorous experiences in high schools, or, or at least uh, we, we've seen that in the past. Um, and that has serious implications for whether or not students have access to college, access to four-year college, access to uh, credit-bearing courses, and whether or not they would perform well once when they're in college. So this is a very important topic. So as policymakers, how can we think about how to improve academic rigor for students in high school? And there have been mainly two lines of strategies going on in the policy area. One is by expanding curricular offerings, and we see this a lot by, by expanding opportunities for students to take AP courses, dual enrollment courses, College Now is really big in New York City, um, international baccalaureate programs, early college high schools, et cetera. The other line of strategy is uh, raising academic norms and expectations for students. And this is done a number of ways. This could include raising the course requirements that students um, need to graduate. This could mean uh, enforcing stronger uh, curricula in high school, and we see this with the common core standards. Um, and it also can include the, um, the use of high stakes exit exams for students um, in order to graduate from high school. So these are the two sort of main lines, but there are other things going on, like teacher PD, uh, the use of small schools, et cetera. There are a number of things going on in the policy field. And these are actually happening in tandem. So it's, as a researcher, it makes it very difficult to disentangle what seems to matter in both of these aspects um, for students' college, uh, college access and success. Um, another challenge in terms of ra uh, researchers, but also uh, those uh, policymakers is does, do these, do these um, strategies seem to pay off? And the challenge has been that we haven't really had the data to, to, to test that. Um, there have been very few school districts across, across the U.S. that have, have the ability to link what's going on in the high school with what's actually going on after students leave the high school. But we see more school districts doing that across the nation. New York is now one of them, as John has mentioned. Um, Chicago I'm going to bring in Chicago now, has been an interesting um, place to do research because they've had this data for a while now. Um, so they've been able to really dig deep and, and try to think about what seems to matter for students' transitions, academic, but also social and financial. And so I'm going to use some of the lessons of the research to, to, to discuss this issue of academic rigor in high schools and how that matters for students' college outcomes. So there are a number of studies. I'm going to talk about two that really point to the importance of academic challenge in high school. Um, the first is a report that, uh, that was done on uh, students, looking at students in IB programs, international baccalaureate pro uh, programs in mm -hmm. Chicago. And what's really unique about this policy is that it was done in the late 90s, and it was expanded to about 13 high schools, which doesn't seem like a lot. but 
This was unheard of. It was expanded to the traditional neighborhood high schools in Chicago. So these are the students who wouldn't usually have access to these selective enrollment high schools. Also, we refer to those as specialized high schools here in New York. So these are the students who wouldn't get into those schools, but are sort of in the middle a bit. They're, they're slightly above average. And so what's interesting about this is when you look at those students and you look at their experiences in high school, they do, they do and see that, uh, indeed say that they are experiencing high academic challenge and engagement when they're in high school. And when you look out a couple years, whether or not they go to college, they do, they're more likely to go to college, they're more likely to go to a four-year college, and they're more likely to stay in college. Um, and when you talk to students, th those students, when they're in college, they say that they feel that uh, that they had the academic preparation in high school to perform well in their college courses. They had the content, the skills. Um, also, they had developed these academic skills and behaviors, often um, referred to as non-cognitive skills in, in uh, the research right now. So they have those time management and organizational skills that really help them manage their coursework. But what's also interesting is they also talked about their academic identity. So they really built these strong academic identities. So they felt like they were lear strong learners and that also helped them in college. Um, from another report, what we find is that when we look at students' uh, college, I mean, uh, their academic experiences in high school and specifically their senior year, we find that very few students actually have access to a um, academically challenging uh, senior year. And this is from their own mouths as well as in the data. So this is something that, that is a cause for concern. Um, it's unevenly distribu distributed across high schools, but also across race and ethnicity. And so that's something of, of, of concern here. But while academic rigor does seem to matter for students' college outcomes, um, I want to draw on two other lines of research that suggest that that's not the the only answer, which I've already talked about in my second slide, which is that there's these other pieces that are going on. And so from one report, we found that grades is a very strong predictor of whether or not a student will do well in college, but also college choice seems to matter. So even among students who are performing um, at high levels, once they enter uh, colleges, their, their outcomes really vary. So this is something uh, that we need to think about as well. Um, and also there is the social piece um, in terms of college planning and getting supports and resources to help students, even those um, who manage to get uh, the academic preparation. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears a bit and give you a sneak peek at uh, an, a forthcoming report from the Research Alliance for New York City Schools where we take a look at patterns of college enrollment, persistence, and degree attainment across the last decade. Um, as John has mentioned, graduation uh, rates in, in New York City high schools has gone up quite a bit, and so this has implications for whether or not we'll see uh, students' rates of enrollment and persistence change over time. But I'm gonna, because this, this panel is on academic rigor, I'm gonna focus on one chapter that focuses on um, what are the difference, what are the academic factors that could possibly explain differences in, in college uh, going patterns. And to measure academic rigor in New York City, I'm going to focus on the different levels of diplomas. So there are three main diplomas, one that's actually currently phased out, um, but this one includes, this research includes that. So there's the, uh, the advanced regents, the regular regents, and the local diploma. And so I'm calling the advanced regents the academically rigorous uh, high school diploma because you need additional coursework, uh, mainly in math and science, to get that degree. Okay, so in terms of enrollment, we see that students with more rigorous high school diplomas were more likely to enroll in college directly after finishing high school in comparison to their peers with um, less rigorous high school diplomas. So about 80% of students with an advanced regents diploma, eight, well 80 to 86, and that has changed a bit over time, uh, enroll in college right away. Whereas 60 to 67% of students with regents diplomas enroll right away, and then far fewer of those um, with local diplomas. And then the 2012, that's the first year that the local diploma was phased out, so there's, that's, that's actually a small proportion of students. Um, so it seems to matter for enrollment, but does it matter for persistence and completion? So when we track students semester by semester to see if they're still around in college and whether or not they get a degree within four years, this is what we find. So this corner is 
These are of students who graduated from high school with an advanced Regents Diploma and enrolled in college uh, immediately after high school. We see that the bars represent whether or not they're still enrolled, the lighter top bars, and then the darker blue represents whether or not they received a degree within four years. So, so persistence is much higher among the students with an advanced Regents Diplomas <coughs> than students with Regents or local diplomas, and those students are also much more likely to get a degree within four years. Um, but even so, there seems to be some issues even among the students who are academically prepared, at least as measured by diploma, um, about 50% get a degree within four years. So um, there's still cause for concern, and, and, and we want to dig a little bit deeper into that. But one reason why we might see differences across the, the different types of diploma types is because students are entering different colleges, right? So I'm going to bring back in that college choice story. And so when we only look at students who leave high school with an advanced regents uh, diploma, and we look at their persistence patterns and their degree attainment patterns, we see quite a bit of variation um, in terms of persistence, out three or five semesters, and whether or not students attain a degree. And the difference is most striking across um, co college completion rates. And this is just across uh, the selectivity of institution that students attend. Um, and this is not to say that selecti selectivity is uh, what we're aiming for, but this is just really to highlight some of the variation that's going on here, even among students who we think are academically qualified to, to do well in college. So um, this, I think this story is something that we want to look into a little bit more um, and, and try to figure out what about these institutions or what is it about the students who attend these institutions that seem to be um, resulting in very different completion rates. Okay, so in summary, I want to uh, again highlight that what we've seen in Chicago and New York who primarily serve black and Latino students, students from low income homes and students who would be first generation college going students is that academic rigor seems to matter quite a bit in terms of their college access and their college success. However, um, many of these students are not gaining uh, access to that and we can talk about the reasons why. Is this about uh, students are not getting prepared in middle schools so they don't have access to that work in high school or whether or not there's a um, uneven distribution of course offerings that could explain why students don't have access to an academically rigorous experience in high school. But there are a number of questions that remain. One being, how uh, do we as educators and policymakers ensure that students college, I mean students uh, preparation in high school pays off in terms of access to college and success? So as I showed you, even in New York City, among those who have advanced regions, there is a significant proportion who don't enroll in college. And so what do we explain that? And can that inform the greater, um, our, our greater understanding of access to college? And then also, even among students who enroll in college, there is a substantial portion, proportion of them that don't get a degree within time. How can we ensure that those students, the students that, we, that have worked hard in high school, how do we make sure that those students uh, get a college degree? And then I think what's really interesting here and what we really need to think about is how can we scale up academic uh, opportunities for students? I think the course offerings mainly focus on a small proportion of students still. Um, so how can we think of, of expanding those opportunities to all students? All right, thank you. I'm sorry, I'm a little challenged. Good morning, everybody. I just wanted to say how happy I am to be among so many people who care about this issue. Um, you're going to hear a lot about program structure and um, policy issues. I'm going to talk about what, is, what can happen in classrooms uh, to help our students to graduate well. And I'm going to do that by talking about one uh, program here at CUNY. Uh, CUNY Start's been mentioned a few times already. Um, the program is much researched. I'm going to talk a tiny bit about the research, but I'm going to mostly be talking about uh, curriculum, instruction, professional development, and the central role that pedagogy has to play in order for us to do better uh, across, uh, across all systems. So I'm going to start by just talking a little bit about CUNY START's program structure. Um, so CUNY START 
offers intensive instruction uh, for students with significant remedial need. Those are students who haven't passed the writing and or reading and math placement tests. Uh, we students have a choice of going to uh, CUNY Start full-time or part-time. Uh, those who attend school part-time go to school for 25 hours a week, five days, it's intensive, full-time, yes, and um, they attend uh, math and reading writing uh, courses as a cohort. Students who go to school part-time go to school for 12 hours a week, again, it's five hours a day, and um, they go to school, they take either reading, writing, or math classes. Um, CUNY START has an intensive uh, advisement component. That advisement uh, component includes many kinds of intrusive advising. Uh, advisors have small caseloads of 75 to 80 students. They uh, work with students one-to-one -one and in small groups. They observe classes. They look at differences in how students are interacting in math versus reading, writing. And they also teach a seminar. It's called College Success Seminar. And they teach many of the uh, non-cognitive skills that were earlier mentioned. Uh, they also uh, help students to understand the credit accumulation structure. Students uh, learn about their majors and begin to plan for how to, how to take courses in their major so they graduate in a timely way. And they also uh, complete their FAFSAs. And that seems to be important for them in moving directly from uh, college transition into credit-bearing courses. Um, unusually, uh, CUNY START uh, has a common curriculum in all of the reading, writing uh, classes. We're at eight campuses, I think I didn't mention that. We're at eight campuses across CUNY, and all the reading, writing, and all the math uh, teachers work with a standard curriculum. Uh, the curriculum was developed by a team of professional developers with uh, a lot of background in history. It's in literacy development, numeracy development, pedagogy, and curriculum design. The curricula are living documents in that we're constantly uh, getting feedback from teachers and we also spend a lot of time, the curriculum development, professional development team, spend a lot of time on campuses and understand how teachers are moving through the, through the curriculum. So it's constantly being revised. Um, we offer semester-long training for everybody who, who is hired as a teacher or an advisor in CUNY START. Uh, that training takes place through apprenticeship. I'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, and there's also some initial uh, upfront training. Um, and we provide professional development. We are a professional development-driven program. So uh, professional development is not something that happens once a year when everybody gathers together. There is a coaching uh, component to our program and professional developers are constantly interacting in numerous ways uh, with the teachers and advisors in the program. Uh, okay, so how are we doing? I'm going to talk for 10 seconds about data, but my colleague Donna Linderman, who will be here later today, will talk much more about CUNY START data. We are a well-researched program um, and this is just one outcome. You should know that most students in our full-time program come to the program with remedial need in three skill areas. And by the time they complete a semester of CUNY START, full 49% of them leave CUNY START and, go and enroll directly into credit-bearing courses without any remedial need. And how this breaks down per skill area, 69% of students pass the reading placement exams, 73% the writing placement exams, and 71% the math placement exams. So comparatively, we're doing well. And, um, and those who don't pass the exams have, ma have made gains. Um, so, so, so far, so good. Um, that's basically what I'm going to say about data. Our part-time program uh, looks similar. The data looks similar. So now I'm going to talk about instruction. And I'm going to start by talking about um, key features of uh, our math curriculum and instruction. So in math classes, there's a strong emphasis on depth over breadth. And um, that's because uh, we are emphasize uh, concept helping students to 
conceptual awareness and to understand and appreciate uh, sort of the conceptual structure of the discipline. So what we do in our math classes is integrate algebra, pre-algebra, and um, number topics. We do this throughout the curriculum. Um, they're, they're interwoven. And um, the goal of doing this is helping students to develop conceptual understanding. Um, sorry, I lost my place. OK, so um, the idea is to foster students' skill in making conceptual connections, understanding the connections between relationships um, with number and algebraic relationships and procedures. That's a really important understanding for them to gain if they're going to be, move beyond uh, sort of procedural understandings, move beyond knowing how, how to plug in procedures and understand that math is a sense-making uh, um, process. And so what ha we help them to make these co uh, connections from the beginning of the class and we build them through extensive work um, mostly uh, involving a kind of relentless questioning. Our students tell us we quest them, question them uh, relentlessly. That is the primary role of the teacher in the math class. Um, the idea is to help students to uh, be able to talk about math, to be able to think in math language, to be able to sort of internalize the problem solving uh, process as it relates to the concepts that are being taught. Um, so we ask many kinds of questions. Some of them include, why did you do it that way? Um, how else could it have been done? Um, how do you know it's correct? What's a common mistake? Um, why would someone make this mistake? Um, is this always true? Asking these kinds of questions to students helps them, uh, one, to actually work through the problems and to be able to see uh, what they're doing if, when they're off course. It helps them to sort of develop a range of strategies for self-correction. Um, it also helps them to reason quantitatively if they're asked to explain what they're doing and why they're doing it. Um, they get to look at how, uh, how a problem can be done in different ways. Uh, this is really important uh, for students because uh, many times they're coming out of classes where they've been taught one way to do something. They don't understand the reasons for doing it that way, and um, they don't always understand how to apply it. If, if something looks a little different, um, they, apl they apply without really thinking through what the differences are. So this is really important. Um, and it also helps students to sort of persevere through uh, the thinking process. And that's, so, th so that's one of the core uh, roles of the teacher in the math class. Um, another thing we do in math class is we scaffold toward abstractions. So we start with real world examples and then eventually we, we provide more uh, formal, formal kinds of uh, examples and more abstract examples. Um, and how this works in class is that students, uh, most of the class time is spent uh, with them working through problems problem sets and explaining what they did uh, based on this cu questioning process. Um, sometimes the examples are organized around a single concept, but most of the time they're mixed. So students are getting examples that require them to do different kinds of procedures, so they really have to think about what the examples mean. Uh, we also provide uh, multiple types of representation. So sometimes students will work equations, sometimes they'll work word problems, sometimes they'll look at graphs. And they're, so it could be the same kind of math, but they, they are understanding sort of the underlying conceptual uh, similarity through the questioning process that helps them tease out sort of the conceptual fundamentals. This is, this is, uh, quite different from a lot of the math experiences that our teachers have had and also the experiences that our students have had. Something that's not up here, I think it's obvious that student talk is a primary means for uh, developing understanding, but something that is also uh, one of our core principles is to engage students in productive struggle. And by that, I mean, um, not, making sure that the student is doing the work and the teacher is not doing the work for the student. Um, students 
expend effort. I'm just I'm using a definition by Hebert and Gross. So where students expend effort to make uh, sense of important mathematical ideas. And that's really at the heart of what we're doing in math classes. Um, in read the reading writing class, um, we also are focused on developing conceptual understanding. Um, what we do is we move from the personal to the academic, so there are two units in the reading writing class. Uh, the first unit is short. It focuses on academic identity. Uh, students read uh, writings uh, by people who have struggled with academic identity, people like Richard Wright, Maxine Hong Kingston, Julia Alvarez. And um, while they are learning some high yield academic strategies like paraphrasing, um, sort of annotating, making inter and intratextual connections, they're also uh, responding personally and um, they're talking about their an both their annotations and their personal responses in small groups as a way to build the cohort, raise their awareness of some of the issues that they are experiencing with respect to academic identity. And um, they're also in this early part of the class starting to track uh, the strategies that they're using to make se sense of complex text and what they're doing in order to repair comprehension when it breaks down. Um, in the second unit, it's called Coming of Age. It's focused on uh, groups of readings, both fiction and nonfiction, themed around that topic. And it's more decidedly academic, so students uh, move away f completely from personal response and they uh, learn to uh, make arguments, they learn to gather evidence, uh, not just from one part of a text, but as time goes on across the text, they learn what a good argument is, and they learn to compose essays that help them sort of make their arguments rhetorically strong. Um, so how do we teach them in the class? We use an approach called uh -oh, cognitive apprenticeship, um, two minutes. A cognitive apprenticeship, we model, uh, we scaffold, and uh, uh, by the end of the course, we release responsibility to the students. Um, we also provide them with sort of tools that help them over time, that take away some of the um, knowledge uh, from the front of the room and give it, gives it to the students. So I'll just talk about one tool and I'll talk about challenges in the question answer period. Uh, we use a discussion journal that always um, asks questions about uh, literary elements that are important for students to understand in order to make good interpretations. They write in the journal, they, um, they talk about their journals in small groups so that we don't have upfront discussions, they talk to each other using the journal. We model for them a way to talk about text, so there's a structured protocol for how they talk about text. Um, and then uh, they give us the journal and we respond to it. So there's a lot of, there's intensive reading, intensive writing, and intensive talk in the classroom. Briefly, I'm going to say that our, uh, our professional development model, you can see that there are many differences in the way we do instruction. Uh, the teacher has to learn just a few things. They have to learn questions, to, uh, how to ask questions to support students to elaborate. They have to become uh, metacognitively aware, they have to understand their own thinking processes in order to model these for students or sort of um, work at, in the moment on how to draw out understanding from students. They are strategic and very skilled in using silence and wait time. And um, I'll skip the last two and talk about it during question answer. And just so you should know, they are apprenticed for a full semester. All uh, teachers are actually um, in an experienced teacher's class for a full semester as apprentices. Uh, the first part of the semester is spent um, observing and then talking about what they see uh, after class. And then um, as the semester proceeds, they take, up, take more responsibility for uh, teaching the classes. Thank you, and um, hopefully <laughs> more time to talk later. Thank you to our panelists um, for their, their great uh, presentations and insights and, and findings so far. Um, what I like about this first panel uh, before we jump into the day um, is it presents kind of the, um, the issues that we're working with. You know, we've talked about and we've, we've heard from our, um, during the welcoming, the welcome address, the numbers and um, both Yusufa, 
Yosefa, Yosefa. sorry, yeah. and Vanessa kind of laid out their research and identified some very specific areas where um, there are some things that we need to address, essentially. Uh, what I love about with um, Gail's presentation is it takes all of that research and it says this is what CUNY can do and this is what CUNY is doing, and it presents the, the strategies. Um, Gail could have easily come up here and talked about how great C CUNY Start is and presented the numbers and um, talked about the graduation rates with those who have matriculated into CUNY. But for a room full of practitioners, um, talking about the actual strategies for how do you work with instructors and faculty to ensure that they're prepared and ready to, to, to work with students who have remedial needs. I, I think this is a great complement to the data um, and the standard deviations that you talked about. Um, <laughs> So um, one thing that I do, one question I do have for Vanessa and Yosefa is, um, and I know we only had 15 minutes to go through your presentations and your, your three books, um, but what are the actual strategies and recommendations that, you've, um, that you have? And again, this is a room full of practitioners that we can actually use and, and be creative and innovative with going forward. Can I go to my last slide? Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a slide that I never got around to uh, that tries to talk about that. Um, so. We are looking at uh, a national sample of students uh, across the United States, not at particular institutions, even though we have since talked to many of these institutions and uh, you know, have kind of seen what they've done. And some of these may still, oops, gotcha. Some of these still may seem abstract, but I think what we've pushed and really argued for, uh, one is leadership, and so I'm glad that leadership is in a room here. Uh, we have really pushed on this issue of the leadership need to emphasize and develop plans for improvement, support ongoing assessment and program development, um, because oftentimes we don't have the data, we don't have the information, we don't know what's going on, and we don't have the support of the administration to actually follow through, test the programs, figure out what's working, give up those that aren't, uh, beef up those that do, and really expand them. Um, so, so we put a lot of pressure on, on leadership to take active role, to take active interest, to really think carefully about what are students doing and how we can improve that. Uh, we also talk a lot about faculty, okay? Um, and you know, the, the importance of faculty having collective responsibility to ensure academic rigor. Um, and, and we really stress this word collective, right? Um, in a world in which students, uh, you know, the students that we've studied and talked to will prefer to take easy classes or give them good grades, right? Students in our sample who study five hours a week, five or fewer hours a week, have a 3-2 GPA, right? So it actually doesn't take a whole lot to make it through. Um, and there's other research that suggests that students choose easier classes and, 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 and will uh, be harsh on instructors who demand uh, of them a lot. So being uh, demanding just by yourself, right, could basically just mean that students leave and go take other classes. Being demanding as a major, right, just means students go to business. Um, and so the question, right, here is how do we as faculty, right, collectively sit down and agree that we are going to have standards, we're going to have expectations, and we're all going to toe the line on those, right? It's not about me and my class, it's not about even me and my program, it's about us as institutions. And that unless we actually have those conversations, you know, about curriculum, we talk very little about, you know, how do we structure it, what does it mean, H how do we actually teach, and uh, because we don't want to intrude on professors' turf, but I think that's really important. And the last one, you know, I, I do want to say is we have to really think how to promote a culture that emphasizes rigor and academics and learning and not just persistence. There's a lot of research that suggests that those things don't necessarily go together, right? Social integration, good time, uh, connections, uh, feeling like you're part of an institution may help you stay in and finish. Those are not necessarily the same factors that will help you take rigorous classes, do very well academically. And so um, I think, you know, it is a bigger picture. It's not a specific kind of what program do you do, but I think unless we think about how to change institutions as a whole, um, you know, the smaller programs may not be as effective. Um, I think much of what Yosef talked about, collective responsibility, having high expectations, having a culture of academic rigor, also plays into the high school, the role of high schools, and so a lot of that works there. But in terms of um, strategies, I was really happy to hear Gail's presentation that really talked about deep instruction and, and 
um, deep learning. And that's something that we saw from the International Baccalaureate uh, program in Chicago. So students who were in academically engaged, that were um, part of, of, of this uh, question, questioning relentlessly and, and part of a productive um, uh, struggle uh, for students, those students seem to, that, that those strategies in engaging students seem to pay off in college. And before we open it up to questions, I just want to give everyone a chance to comment on other um, on presentations. Gail, if you have anything to. I just I, I have a question about the the assessment that you created. I'm really curious. This isn't a challenging question, but I, I was wondering how you how you decided on sort of what the measures were and you know how that was tested out. I understand that another another place tested it, but I'm wondering if the, what the process was for d developing that? So, I mean, uh, the CLA, right, I think if you, uh, the best place to direct you to is their website, which is collegiallearningassessment.org, I think. They have uh, examples of the assessment. Uh, they have uh, examples of rubrics in terms of how do they break down this critical thinking conversation and writing, right? What does that actually look like? Um, students have hour and a half, students actually have multiple assessments, we are focusing on one, we are focusing on the this task component, they're also writing and a reading uh, part of this, um, and you know, they train the readers, and, and uh, I mean, I, you know, I think the, the, they train the readers to readers read it, they give it scores, they, they deal with the, uh, what's in between, the rubrics are quite well developed. They've been doing this for many years. They now have a CLA plus, they actually have a slightly different version. As you might imagine, this form of assessment is very labor intensive, and I think what struck me about Gail's conversation is that, you know, trying to do this well, and whether this means, you know, teaching math and reading or, or teaching students how to think critically is it is a really intensive labor. And so uh, assessing it as well is intensive labor because you can just ask them how much mm -hmm. do you think you've learned or you can give them some multiple choice tests if you want to give them some kind of a task that actually involves them being engaged and writing an essay, well then you have to grade those essays, you have to figure out how to actually do that, right? And so what struck me across uh, the presentations was um, you know, how intensive um, lots of this work is when it is actually done well. And so, um, you know, unfortunately, I'm not sure we have easy solutions. So I'm gonna go ahead and open it up to um, audience questions. Um, there are microphones floating around as well. Hi, my name is Erica Jackson from NYU. My question is for Gail. I was curious about the, I don't know if you can answer it in a couple of minutes, what the curriculum is for the writing classes um, to get students college ready to do college level research papers. I found that students have a very difficult time coming out of high school being able to do essay work. Um, I do an SAT program in New Jersey, and it's very difficult with high school seniors just getting them to do an essay for the SAT. So I can only imagine when they get into college doing research college level work. And I was curious about what's taught or what that curriculum is to get them at such a degree where they would be able to handle that. And if there's support services afterwards for them as they're going through their, their college career. So CUNY START is a one semester program and I, our primary goals in the, pro, in the reading writing part of the program is to help students to uh, be able to do early college level work. So to be able to enter a credit bearing course and, be, uh, and understand the expectation and be able to read and write based on those expectations. Um, I, we do the work with the discussion journal Right now we are piloting a um, completely non-fiction based curriculum, but I didn't talk about it yet because it's still in a pilot phase um, where they will do more research-like activities. But in, in, in the reading writing class right now, they primarily read literature and they, they work with this core tool. We call it a tool it's called the discussion journal. Um, and in the discussion journal, they're always asked about character character change, author's point of view, how those things intersect, and, um, and about language choice, because they need to see the text as something constructed by an author and not 
life, you know, not just an extension of life. So um, the goal is to help them over time to get better at that. And what we do is we ask them the same questions throughout a semester using this discussion journal, and we place increasing demand on them. They engage in small group discussion that's very um, structured. We teach them a protocol for how you talk about text, and um, we support them to internalize that protocol so that there's not sort of a separation between the reading, the writing, and the talk. It's all, it's all related. And um, they hear a range of responses in discussions, so they're sort of getting feedback on their discussion journals. They're hearing how other people responded, and then they get teacher feedback, and then they revise. They're learning, they revise in class, so they're learning to read teacher comments, which students have to learn how to do when they go to college, and research says that they don't read those comments. Um, so, so we're teaching them a lot of things at, all at once. One thing I wanted to say in terms of challenge is that, you know, when students enter college after taking CUNY START, they really could do with uh, teachers who understand this kind of pedagogy on the credit-bearing side and who help to sort of continue this kind of work. And I think that there's a great need for us to talk about pedagogy throughout, um, throughout the student's college experience. So I think it's a hard question. I don't know if I answered it, but. <laughs> Quick question. Um, can you explain more a little bit about the cohort concept in the START program and the importance uh, that that plays? In yes, yeah, sure. So they, students uh, take their reading, writing, and math classes as a cohort. Um, they spent most of their time talking to each other. Um, so the cohort enables them, it pr provides a place of safety for them. Um, in the beginning of the class, they're learning a lot of things to do that they, don't, they haven't done before in terms of talk and in terms of sort of using their work as the basis for talk and, and comparison. So the cohort structure, uh, they spend a lot of time together and we, we actually um, create the group work in intentional ways. We switch them up a lot at first so they get to know each other. Um, in the, the language and thinking portion of the course, um, they do a lot of sort of metacognitive work on um, how they, uh, about a academic identity and things that they need to do in order to form an academic identity. And there's less pressure on them in those early weeks to do a lot of rig rigorous academic work, but we do step it up. And so the cohort enables them to. The classes are about 20, there are about 25 students in each class. Good morning. Um, my name's Lon, I'm with Good Shepherd Services. And um, as I was looking through the data, uh, something that popped in my head a lot was that we seem to be addressing the issue at a critical time, um, that, that the, the situation has already become critical for these young people in high school and these young people who are at attending college. And I'm wondering if um, you have come across any research or data or studies that looks at more preventive measures from PK to eight so that we can uh, look at reducing the number of young people we actually have to do triage for um, by the time that they get into college. Yeah, I mean, our students are students who enter for your institutions and we track them forward, uh, but there's plenty of sociological literature that goes back down to basically birth. Right, uh, I mean, the, the gaps in terms of uh, racial, ethnic, and class gaps emerge by, by when kids are very early on. Right? By ages two or three, we already start seeing the gaps. By the time kids enter kindergarten, there are big gaps, and they just keep getting bigger. Right? So I think you're absolutely right, and there's this question about where do you start, and are we essentially too late? By the time students enter four institutions and they're not ready, um, you know, we have 18 years uh, to make up for, and do we really have to start very early on. There's lots of evidence that early programs, even pre-K, right, two to four, two to five, are crucial in getting kids on track. Um, and so I, there's, you know, I'm happy to talk afterwards. There's plenty of research on that topic. But I think to me the question is, you know, we've always passed the blame down, right? So high school blame the middle schools, middle schools, elementary schools, 
well, colleges, we blame K through 12. Um, <laughs> so, but I, I think, the, and, the, and, and there is something to it, right, that these, these problems and issues of, you know, there's very clear trajectories in terms of where students start and how much they improve over time. Uh, but until we reform, you know, everything in this country, um, the question is where do we start with where we are now? And so I think every part of the system is gonna have to do what we can. And we see that kids, even when they enter, you know, high school or colleges, we can improve and we can make a difference. It's not gonna, you know, make up for those 18 years, but there's movement. And so, yes, do we have to start at birth, essentially, we do, but we also have to do with what we have right now. There is a line of research that looks at the importance of ninth grade and how students are academically performing in the ninth grade and looking at tools that schools can use to track students' performance starting at the ninth grade. So they, they could build interventions to, mm -hmm. to keep students on track. Most of that is centered around looking at the importance of keeping students on track to high school graduation that hasn't been really extended into college. And so this is a unique opportunity because schools in um, districts have never had that data and so we can actually now think about how would that how would college readiness track back into the ninth grade and how do we keep those students on track to college um, I have a question for Vanessa I found um, really interesting in one of your slides um, particularly that the uh, somewhat selective four-year institution had the, the lowest completion rate lower than the two-year and the the non-selective and open enrollment. I was wondering if you did any research into that or digging deeper to explain it. Not yet. Um, that is something we're definitely going to look into. So one point of clarification I want to make that could be related to that is that, um, so I included uh, selectivity of four-year institutions as well as two-year institutions. And so the two-year institutions could have higher completion rates because we're using four years to look at a two-year degree. And so that could uh, account mm -hmm. for the, the difference in between let's say two year and somewhat selective. But there is still something going on there that we want to look um, closely at. I mean, is this one particular institution or is there something unique about this collection of institutions that's driving low completion rates? Yeah. Um, good morning. My name is uh, Jane Martinez Dowling and I'm the ED for Kip Through College here in New York. Um, and my question is specifically for Gail, kind of following up on what Lon had asked. Um, we do a lot of transition work the second semester of senior year at our Kip NYC College Prep High School. And I was just wondering if you all had all explored the possibility of having CUNY start, start that second semester in high school if we're identifying students that we are pretty sure are not ready to attend, at, attend even our two-year schools as opposed to waiting for them to begin um, at the, after their senior year. Well, we were, we've been in expansion mode for, <laughs> for five years, so I, I don't think we have thought about that yet, um, but that's an interesting idea. Can I, can I give the myth to that, um, John? Um, we have thought about it at other levels, and we had lots of discussions with people in the department today about trying to figure out how to do things like that. We have a college focusness program that does similar kinds of things. We really believe we're on to something in the heating of, of reading, writing, and math. No reason to think that, as you said, students who are seniors in high school um, would, you know, greatly benefit from this kind of instructional approach that they could get out of the mediation before they leave uh, high school. It would be a huge victory. Um, now we have a new administration at the Department of Ed, and we're just beginning to uh, redefine our relationship with with them. But it is something that I would think would be the next stage of our conversation. I don't know where to start. <laughs> My name is Larry Davis. I'm the Borough Family Advocate for Brooklyn High Schools. I have a 13-year-old and a 15-year-old. When my youngest was in the third grade, she had a teacher who went out and found a school that her children attended that had gifted and talented. And she brought that work to her class. And my, child, my, my daughter was experiencing great learning. She had the questions, she had the understanding. This teacher was very, very loved. By the time she got to the fourth grade, they gave her a seasoned teacher who caused her to digress. 
And, and I just want you to see this. And one of the things that I learned in the conversation with my wife about that is that if you are willing to teach children the way the third grade teacher taught, you've got to be willing to do the work. And the problem in the system is this. We're not having the conversation to deprogram those individuals who are set in their ways and not willing to change expectations. And this is absolutely wonderful, but I think it needs to be exposed to the Department of Education at a very early time. The superintendents need to hear this so that they can begin to speak. The teachers need, the principals need to hear this so that they can begin to speak it because it's a lot of deprogramming that needs to take place. Not only for the educators, but even for those people who are learning. And, and once we begin to have conversations like this, I think our academic systems can be better. But as long as we keep waiting for them to get to the ninth grade and then getting ready to go into high school and then going to college, that problem is going to keep rotating and recycling itself. So what happens now in the elementary school? Because I believe that that's where the conversation needs to take place. And how do we get a body of individuals to, I don't want to use the word forcefully, but I'm going to use it, to forcefully push this? Because if you can build prisons at the statistics of the reading scores of fourth, fourth graders, then you can change the attitude of individuals who teach them so that they can become more productive in college. Hi, my name is Kevin Finnegan and I work with iMentor. My question was for Vanessa, sort of a follow-up to one of the earlier questions about um, your work in Chicago and Chicago Public Schools as CPS is sort of leading the way in now requiring um, high school administrators to really be accountable for student success, matriculation, and persistence in college. I was wondering if you had a chance to look at the six-year graduation rates, as we know, um, with a lot of the students that we're talking about moving from a two-year to a four-year or taking a semester off is certainly something that can happen. And um, how would, if you had a chance to research the six-year graduation rates, how would that look in um, difference with the highly selective IV students? Uh, in Chicago, I believe we looked at six-year rates for a very early uh, cohort of students, and that work was not tied to IB at that point, but what we did find was that students' six-year uh, six rates um, did vary quite a bit by students' um, academic preparation, and I, and I mean test scores and GPA. GPA was a better predictor of those six-year rates, but um, so that, that's the the only piece that we looked at at six-year rates. Unfortunately, I, I mean, I would love to show you six-year rates in New York City, um, but cur we currently don't have that data, but we, we will add that to the conversation, tie that into students' um, academic experiences in high schools. Hi, I'm just, I'm still sort of sitting here. Hi, <laughs> Emily from Goddard Riverside. Um, I'm, I'm just sitting here sort of bothered about this academic rigor, the major of business, which is so popular among so many of our students and is growing rapidly across for-profit colleges, right, and liberal arts schools who are trying to recruit more and retain. Um, and I'm wondering if you've looked into or seen any research about when faculty become more involved in mentorship roles, right, and, and building mm -hmm. cohorts among those programs how social entrepreneurship can be sort of a tie-in to build like business connected to deepening your involvement in your community and, mm -hmm. and seeing not just making money but impacting sort of greater pieces. Um, and I think a lot of us have read the article about the Texas professor at the public university, right, who really mm -hmm. had such a deep impact Mm -hmm. on this cohort of students and connecting them to their academic identity and all of that. So I'd love you to speak to that if you can. Yeah, no. Well, thank you. I, you know, what's, I don't know, frustrating is that we do have great examples here or there. So what I've showed you is national data, right? And that national data looks terrible. Okay? Now, that does not mean that there are not these pockets. There isn't this one awesome third grade teacher. There isn't this one awesome business teacher who is connected to the community, who is really engaging, who is willing to sacrifice everything to make sure that the students learn and gain and improve and have a great, uh, you know, kind of are prepared for the next steps. Um, 
there also there's a huge amount of variation. So what I showed is kind of the average trend, right? If you took a business major as a whole, right, you would find a huge amount of variation, right? You would find business majors and business students who are, you know, developing skills and doing really well and really improving and highly engaged and, and reading and writing a lot, and you'll find the other ones, right? So, um, I mean, I, you know, so, you know, we can talk, there is research on, you know, how much faculty matter, how much engagement matters, how much mentoring matters. Lots of it is done in STEM, but I think extends beyond that. So science and math, right, lots of research on mentoring and advising and how much of a difference that makes, particularly for students who enter um, with kind of less prepared for, to succeed in those areas. Um, I think what, what pains me is that all of those are these great kind of jewels that are spread across the nation in one place here and there. But we're not making the change and we're not making progress on a broader scene. And so the question is how do we take these, you know, how, how do we make it that it's not this one unique person who is just amazing, but it's actually changing the system to, te to prepare the students for what they need to do in college and afterwards. This is really a follow up. Your <coughs> co authored book, uh, Academically Adrift, was as noted, as discussed, uh, as reviewed, as almost anything in recent years in higher education. So this is a classic case of did it make a difference? Is it making a difference? Um, it's actually the same for the kind of research you're seeing in IBs in Chicago. Um, when I sat in Albany, the bandwidth for actually doing anything with research was about a millimeter <laughs> wide. Um, uh, you know, we more or less heard my senior deputy, John King, now the commissioner and I, that, uh, you know, IBs were a good idea, um, but it was about 111,000th on our list of priorities. So uh, are you getting responses at the policy level, given, I mean, if your book didn't, then no book will. So this is a very depressing statement. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of the end of the world kind of a statement. Um, you know, I, I think what the book did, right, it's still lots of conversation, people talked a lot, uh, but there's a big difference between talking and action. Um, and, and I think there's a serious breakdown there. Uh, we've, Richard Aram, uh, who's at NYU, and, and myself have traveled to uh, lots of institutions afterwards and talked about it, and we've met with administrators, we've met the teachers, and, you know, what I would say the change has been that there are individual institutions, and individual administrators, individual programs that are kind of starting to look inward, starting to examine their curricula, starting to say, you know, how do we teach? Why don't we not teach in a very engaged sort of way? I mean, this 200 person lecture with person at the front, right, is not a way to learn. Um, and so, so there have been a lot of conversations and lots of individual people taking action. Um, but you know, the question is, is that going to, you know, are those the little pieces that will eventually add up to the grand puzzle and really create the movement to change, or are those gonna stay, those little pieces in individual places? And um, on the optimistic days, I'm thinking that all those little pieces will eventually come together and actually lead toward the future. And I think the question, especially uh, earlier, that we're gonna have to, right, in terms of how much we are falling behind other nations in uh, graduate production, how much we are not preparing students for 21st century. I mean, it, at some point, we're gonna have to kind of wake up to that reality. Uh, I would hope that sooner rather than later. In terms of policy, policy response um, for the IB study, actually, Policymakers were quite receptive and open to, to listening to research. That's sometimes a blessing and a curse. Um, so after our report came out and we had briefings with policymakers, um, Rob Emanuel, the mayor, uh, announced a, a big, ex a further expansion of the International Baccalaureate Program. However, there are some differences between what we saw prior to the research and now what was being implemented. So these programs that were normally small programs within large neighborhood high schools and sort of functioned as a small school within a school. Um, and so uh, students were able to set up these tight-knit cohorts as well that they really seemed to, to work well with. Um, now they're switching to a whole school, whole school model. Um, for IB, and so the jury is still out. We don't know whether or not that 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 um, mm -hmm. the findings from our research will also uh, be there when, in, in this whole school model. So on one hand, it's great that they're listening to research and taking into consideration the importance of, of academic rigor, but also some things are changing, and so we'll have to see um, whether or not that pays off. I want the right, <laughs> right. That's true. <laughs> they should pay attention to New York. 
Hi, I'm uh, George from Askew, uh, which represents a group of what I call the non-highly selective uh, public institu four-year institutions. I'm just curious, uh, in that sneak peek you had of the uh, you know, graduates of New York City high schools, whether you have institutional characteristics that talk, you know, that relate to item factors such as residential, non-residential, urban, non-urban, suburban. Uh, I suspect that, at least in my head, there are some differences at institutions uh, that may affect student persistence in graduation in terms of access to services, uh, uh, course programming, and stuff like that. Absolutely. So we do have our, um, we have linked our data set to IPEDS data, which gives us some more information about the characteristics of those post-secondary institutions. However, we don't have that level of information about uh, the specific resources and supports that, that these institutions are offering to mm -hmm. low-income students, um, black and, and Hispanic students, and first-generation college goers. We would love that information, but no one seems to be collecting that at a systems level, no one, no one, I don't, not, not that, well, maybe there's something there. If you, if you know of something, please let me know. I would love to get my hands on that data. But we are going to work with the, the data that we do have from iPads to also dig in deeper to, to figure out what's going on and why institutions vary so much by college completion. We have time for one more question. Great. Hello, my name is Karina Semankis. I'm a college advisor for a public school here in the city. And I'd like to echo the sentiments of a couple of my colleagues in terms of starting earlier. Um, the, you know, the research, the data, I'm, like I think it's something that we all love to read through. We, you know, take it all in, it's wonderful, but it's really hard at the high school level when kids are coming in with a second, third grade reading level. Um, and we are, you know, we're supposed to like provide rigor and more challenging courses and connections and try to connect them with those um, colleges that are going to help them be successful. It's a struggle. We don't have, you know, like we need a CUNY start at the junior high school level. You know, something there to kind of get them better prepared for high school so that they can hit the ground running and actually, you know, learn at a, at a higher level. Um, and do more challenging, you know, take on more challenging programs. Like, I think we need more programs, um, you know, funding, I know that's like, you know, I don't know, I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. Um, funding, we don't even have space. Like, we do not have space, we don't have enough classrooms to hold certain classes and programs, et cetera. So, we need stuff at a much younger age to be implemented so that, you know, the stats are not as depressing later on. Agreed, but I think until we get those 10th graders to be reading at a 10th grade level, um, you know, what are we going to do now? And I think that's, you know, the question. And, and I'd like to just echo Gail's thing. I think what we do in terms of preparing teachers to teach and get teachers to be engaged makes a huge difference. It makes in K-12, in higher education, right? faculty receive very little, if any, instruction in teaching. Right? <laughs> They're being put into the classrooms to teach undergraduates primarily with very little if any instruction in teaching and so you know uh, why would we expect essentially better outcomes than the ones we are seeing when the people who are responsible for developing our students skills knowledge understanding these positions are not uh, trained to actually do that and so um, I'm totally with you I, you know I'm a sociologist by training it's all about structure it's all about context it starts at birth um, and we have to worry about the whole pipeline from early on uh, but at the same time, I step back and I say, but you know, until I have all, you know, college entrants who are ready to do college level work, what are we going to do until then? Hi, I'm Janice Bloom. I'm the co-director of uh, College Access Research and Action. Um, and I've been sitting here thinking I was so struck, Gail, by the data about CUNY Start. And it's such great data. And at the same time, I felt heartbroken that students could learn in a semester they sat there for four years in high school and they didn't learn that stuff and I felt really heartbroken about that as someone who has taught and done professional development in high school for years. So I've been sitting here trying to think what my question is because I don't want to just be <laughs> one of those people who talks. But I think my question is, what I've seen is that good high school teachers do the things that you are talking about in yes. CUNY Start. And so why aren't they doing it? One of the things that I have seen over the past 20 years that is misdirecting high school teachers away from doing that kind of work is the assessments to which they are held accountable, they and their students, 
and that's the Regents' exams that push uh, teachers to cram information into students rather than focusing on skills. So I think my question is, what can higher education do to push K through 12, or let's just focus on high school, to better assessments? Because the problem is when, and I'm not blaming you, Vanessa, when we, what we call um, rigor is regents. I don't, I, I take issue in many ways with that as rigor. I think what the CLA does sounds like rigor. How, so it's a big question, how can we reframe assessment in our city and our country, but how can higher education say, here's what we're looking for, we're looking for that stuff, and we're not looking for, do you know who, um, who was the head of the Ottoman Empire in 1500? We don't care if you know that. So, so I think that's my question. I also take, right, I also agree that um, a region score is probably not a good indicator of rigor. Um, we also saw that in Chicago, there was a very heavy emphasis on um, uh, test prep around the ACT. And we actually found in the research that um, classrooms that focused heavily on test prep did not have better test scores. And actually the classrooms where students were academically engaged in, in, in their work, um, um, from the, two, from the students' uh, responses to surveys, those are where you saw the biggest gains in test scores. And right. I just want to say that I think, I mean, we have a test that we have to, that students take at the end of their, you know, and I, every test has a narrowing, you know, you can narrow your full instruction to the test. I think that one of the things that CUNY START does that you have to pay for, it's expensive, is consider the role of coaching and professional development. So, and sort of acknowledge that that, that is part of, program development. It's not just about, it. structure is important, you know, having longer classes is important, having intrusive advisement is important, but somehow um, the role of pedagogy is minimalized in this conversation nationally, and I think that we have to find a way to um, help our, we've been very generously supported. John has been amazing in terms of advocating for this role in CUNY START. And I think that that is one of the reasons why we've had such success. Our teachers are speaking a common language and they also have opened their classrooms. So I think it's important for classrooms not to, for teachers not to be sort of in these autonomous modules and they don't have to have shame about not knowing how to do it on the faculty, you know, on a faculty level. And I think that that is gonna help everyone to do the, to do the work better, even if there is a lousy test. I think you can do the, you can, if, if you help students to learn better, I can take those tests and pass them, you know. So it means that we have to be able to, what we're doing in the classroom has to help so that they can just see that test as a, you know, a very narrow genre that they have to deal with, improve instruction. Well, again, thank you to our panelists for their uh, thoughtful uh, contributions.